Welcome to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz. This episode, we're going to be talking about veterans of chemical warfare. And with me, I have a guest who has worked a lot with a lot of veterans around the United States. I have Michael McPherson, who's the interim director of the Veterans for Peace. Do I have that right, Michael? Well, I'm executive director now. Okay, exact. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, that's right. yes. Okay, so now you're ex executive director of Veterans for Peace, and that's, that's right. nationally across that's the right. country. <clears throat> Excuse that, me, that's that, right. That's fantastic. Could you tell us a little bit about what Veterans for Peace is and what it does? Sure. Well, first, I want to thank you for having me on the show. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Veterans for Peace is a national veterans organization that was founded in 1985. It was founded mm -hmm. actually by some Vietnam veterans who were concerned about nuclear proliferation and the arms race, mm -hmm. and, and U.S. intervention in Central and Latin America. Um, so next year will be our 30th anniversary. 2015 will be the 30th anniversary. That's anim right. 30th 20, anniversary. 2015 will be our, yeah. our 30th anniversary. <laughs> it is our 30th anniversary. That's Fantastic. Right. So wh what, uh, what is the largest group? Or, I, I think you have veterans from every war. People have been stationed in Af Afghanistan. That's people right. have been stationed in yes. Iraq. Yes. Probably stationed in all over the world. Right. 180, what is it, 150, 180 countries? 180 the countries or so. Mm -hmm. So um, we actually have, well, now we have veterans from World War II all the way up, as you said, through the current conflicts, the global, so called global mm -hmm. war on terror. And really, we had veterans until like five years ago that were from the Spanish uh, Civil War, believe oh, wow. it or not. Yeah, <laughs> these guys, amazing. as old as they were, are very mm -hmm. sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, we have veterans that, that cover the spectrum. Um, our membership also includes associate members who are non-veterans. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we keep about 75% of our, of our membership as veterans because we're a veterans organization. Right. But we also mm -hmm. want people to become part of VFP who agree with us that war, we were veterans for peace, so we believe war is not the answer and we want to abolish war as a means to solve conflicts. Okay, and so is there any one particular war that has a lot of members of veterans? Right, so peace? yeah, uh, I would say that right now, and this is slowly changing um, as our Vietnam veterans get older, um, but uh, Vietnam veterans are the bulk of our membership um, mm -hmm. and, and the most active portion of our membership. Uh, we, as I said, we have Korean War veterans in World War II, but the Vietnam veterans are the bulk. Okay, and, and is it all male, or are there any uh, women? Oh, no, no, it's not, it's not all male. Um, of, course, of course, we're disproportionately male, right. um, but we have a, a good, strong um, um, female mem veteran members, and mm -hmm. um, of course, a lot of female associate members, but we have a, a real strong mm -hmm. mixture. Um, we are, um, in, in terms of, of um, diversity, mm -hmm. um, we would like to increase our diversity, um, we are primarily a white male organization, right. um, and, and in, interestingly, in terms of the peace movement, um, that's probably the other way around. The peace movement pro mm -hmm. predominantly seems to be white women, mm -hmm. um, but um, we're, we're working on our diversity through the programs and things that we do. Okay, so is, is everybody in Veterans for Peace a, a U.S. citizen, or do you have people from other countries? No, you can, is, well, right now, we recently became um, international. So okay. we have a chapter in the United Kingdom. Um, we also have a chapter in Vietnam. Um, the, the chapter in Vietnam are uh, U.S. expatriates, I guess you could say, or, or U.S. Okay. citizens, U.S. veterans of the U.S. military who went to Vietnam and, and, and want to participate in healing um, and, and showing, uh, I guess, um, repentance uh, to the people of Vietnam. But um, our bylaws state that if you are a a veteran of another military, but you live in the United States, Yes. then, mm -hmm. then you can be a member of Veterans for Peace. And we're trying to get um, different countries to form their own chapters of Veterans oh, for Peace. Okay, great. So, so somebody who is a Spanish citizen or, or you know, Canadian citizen, but had been in the military, right. and those countries could join Veterans for Peace right. in the U.S. Right, they could start their own, mm -hmm. own chapter or they could become an international, international member. Okay. One of the things that I've noticed over the years is, is that 20 years ago, when I talked to people about Agent Orange, right. m most people did not know what I was talking about. But as the years go by, even though, though we're more distant in time from the Vietnam War, it seems to me that more and more people are aware of what Agent Orange, what the effects were. Yeah. Um, so could, could, and since m the greatest number of people, of members of Vets for Peace are from the Vietnam War era, is there a lot of concern with Agent Orange? Well, sure, um, there is a lot of concern. And I would say, it's interesting that you say in the last 20 years, um, and recently Rambo, 
they they've been showing Rambo movies on on TV, mm -hmm. and generally, you know, I think the Rambo movies are, are kind of silly. But the first one, uh, First Blood, I think is the name of it, uh -huh. is actually a pretty good movie. And at the beginning of it, um, if I remember correctly, because I I didn't get a chance to watch the the recent mm -hmm. um, showing of it, but um, uh, Sylvester Stallone or Rambo was walking and he stopped by a friend's house or, or you know, neighborhood and happened to be an African-American person, but the guy was dead. He had died of cancer. Uh -huh. And he had died of cancer as a result of Agent Orange. So they had talked about, and I don't know, I mean, Rambo came out, I don't know, in, in the maybe late 80s, early 80s or something. So it's been quite mm -hmm. a while because mm -hmm. I remember I was a kid. Um, so they talked about it in that movie and tried to and made it an issue, you know, mm -hmm. that that soldiers were dying, that veterans were dying from Agent Orange. Um, so I think what has happened over the years and and Rambo being the example of that, that Agent Orange as uh, as an issue uh, for veterans has become part of popular culture and that average people, you know, they hear Agent Orange and and, you know, Maybe people who are 18 or 22 might not mm -hmm. know it, but people um, older than that kind of do, and I just think it's, it's seeped into popular culture. And yes, it is a, a big issue for our veterans, not only because a number of them might, might or are affected by Agent Orange, but also because the people of Vietnam um, have been extremely um, affected in a detrimental way, and um, our members having decided that war is not the way to solve problems, um, feel a huge sense of responsibility. Right. Um, and wanting to hold the companies responsible who the companies manufactured it okay. and uh, the United States government. And one of those companies was Monsanto, wasn't it? That's right. Um, there were a number of them, but Monsanto and Dow, I believe, mm -hmm. were uh, pr the predominant manufacturers. There were probably five or six others. Uh, but right, the, the, right, and I know that a, a lot of times when I've been out at Pickett's at Monsanto World Headquarters and people are talking about genetically modified food, right. there's virtually always somebody there who's a Vietnam War era veteran right. who, who's reminding people of Monsanto's role in the production of Agent Orange. That's right, that's right. Well, uh, uh, before we get into the human, of how it affects people, what was the effect of Agent Orange on some of the uh, vegetation and, and some of the uh, environmental effects? Right. In, in well, Vietnam? the whole purpose of using it was to destroy plant life. Mm -hmm. And the strategy uh, was to destroy the plant life so that the peasants or the people, the villagers, wouldn't, able, wouldn't be able to grow food, and then they would have to move. And the idea... Now, now of course, that's not what's told to the average citizen. Yeah. What we hear is that Agent Orange was used because it would stop the, it would mean the Viet Cong would not have a cover. Right. And, and, yes. then, and then supposedly would destroy, save soldiers' lives. It would, it would save soldiers' yeah. lives. In order to save soldiers' lives, we had to blanket the area with defoliants. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And of course, mm -hmm. I mean, it, it did that as well. Mm -hmm. but, but the purpose of it was, see, when you have a, a civil war or you mm -hmm. have an insurgency, um, usually the, the population has a relationship with, with the people that the outsider, which was the, the people of the U.S. or, mm -hmm. or you know, the U.S. Army or the French Army, um, the people at home have a relationship with the, with the insurgents. So um, what they wanted to do was break that relationship, and they wanted to force uh, the, the peasants or, or the villagers into spaces that were controlled by the U.S. or controlled by the South right. Vietnamese. So, strategic hamlets was right, the phrase. That's right, that's what they call it. That's right, strategic hamlets. So they were trying mm -hmm. to force people, basically force people off their land. Right. And so in order to do that, they needed to destroy their ability to grow food. And, and, and so the, the Agent Orange would have that effect. It, it would that's make right. it very difficult. It, um, poison, it basically it, it poisons, it, it poisons the um, soil, you okay. know, so, so things won't grow. I mean, it's a herbicide. Right. That's basically what it is. Right. So it's, it's like it's, Roundup, you know. A lot more powerful than Roundup, but yes. ba basically the same concept. Right. That's okay. right. Look, uh, we're going to take a break to see a movie about some of the effects that Agent okay. Orange ha had, a short short movie, and then we'll be, be back to discuss it in, in just a few minutes. So uh, l let's take a look at that movie right now.
During the Vietnam War, the U.S. military sprayed and dumped an estimated 20 million gallons of chemicals in an attempt to destroy enemy hiding positions in the forest. Agent Orange. The chemical used in this campaign not only destroyed the forest, but it also caused and continues to cause chromosomal damage in humans. Chemicals were also sprayed on crops. 688,000 acres of farmland were sprayed with a chemical called Agent Blue. The U.S. government claimed that these chemicals were harmless to people and only had a minor impact on the environment. But more than 5,000 American scientists disputed these claims and signed a petition against chemical and biological weapons being used in Vietnam. Despite their efforts, the United States government did not stop using these chemical agents until the conflict was almost over. Soon after the war ended, veterans began to complain about serious health problems. They developed painful skin rashes followed by liver diseases and then stomach and lung cancers. The cancer had erupted on his skin and 10 months later he was gone. There was an unusually high number of birth defects among children born to Vietnam veterans who were exposed to Agent Orange. During this time, they struggled to have the Veterans Administration provide testing, treatment, and compensation, while the U.S. government tried to deny any responsibility. Eventually, in 1984, the chemical companies who manufactured Agent Orange agreed to pay $180 million in damages to our veterans. It wasn't until 1991 that the U.S. government finally started to compensate our soldiers for exposure to Agent Orange. Since that time, more conditions have been acknowledged, but many others are still not recognized. In Vietnam, the reality of Americans' chemical warfare has slowly began to unfold. Agent Orange seeped into the soil and water supply and therefore into the food chain. In this way it passed from mother to children. These chemicals remain in the soil today and are now damaging the health of the current civilian population. Vietnamese authorities are just now beginning to grasp the true scale and long-term consequences of the devastation wreaked by Agent Orange. Welcome back to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz. We're talking about veterans of chemical warfare, and with me I have uh, Executive Director of Veterans for Peace, Michael McPherson. Um, Michael, one of the things that we just saw in the movie, which was American Chemical and Biological Warfare, uh, uh, Agent Orange, was that th th they talked, uh, I noticed the way that they presented it was slightly different from the way that you presented yeah. it because they presented as it was used as a defoliant right. and then incidentally it was used in the right. farms, right. which is uh, sort of the popular view, but you're saying no, actually it was, you know, it was used, and, and that's what I've read recently, is, yes. that, is it was used primarily to destroy agriculture yeah. and, and to force people into the strategic hamlets and then used, uh, it was also used as, uh, you know, f uh, as a defoliant. Yeah. Was there anything else about the movie that stuck in your mind? Well, just seeing the images mm -hmm. of, of the people of Vietnam, especially mm -hmm. uh, the children, people who have been born since the conflict, because um, as you could see from those pictures, a number of those people have been born recently. Right. You know, so um, it's just so sad and, and hurts my heart, as, especially as a, a, as a soldier, mm -hmm. but as an American citizen that um, look what we did to that country and, and how um, the, the impact is still around. You know, mm -hmm. that could be that could be my son, or, or mm -hmm. it could, I have a grandson and a granddaughter. Mm -hmm. um, it could be it could be them, you know. So that that's very hurtful, right? And and, and that's something we're talking about Americans' involvement through the 1960s, especially late 1960s and, and uh, first few years of the 1970s. Yeah. So we're we're talking about uh, decades ago, right? And and still children are being born with those defects, and of course right. if you have genetic defects, then that's going to, if they, if they alter the chromosomes, that's going to be passed down through generation after generation. That's correct, and, and the same thing for the Vietnam veterans. A um, number of them have had children, and there's an organization 
um, of, of children of Vietnam veterans that have birth defects, as, at least as they see it, as a result of Agent Orange. So it's not only impacting the people in Vietnam, which is profoundly impacted them more mm -hmm. than it is impacting us here in the U.S., but it impacts us here as well. And, and interestingly, it impacts us in different ways because um, when they manufactured the Agent Orange, uh, the chemical, um, which dioxin is, is what is the, uh, uh, the agent in it, that, that's the poison. And, mm -hmm. and people might not know this, but it's, it's the most poisonous chemical known to humans, to humanity, that's the most poisonous <laughs> chemical that there is, mm -hmm. um, that, they, that is in this. Um, so there are sites around the country uh, that are contam contaminated because these were sites that maybe they were using to manufacture it or is when they put it on, on ships or airplanes or, you know, when they transported it. So we have hot spots even here in the United States, much less um, in Vietnam, where there's high concentrations of, of dioxin from, from Agent Orange. And of course, one of the hot spots for um, dioxin in the United States was Times Beach, Missouri. That's right. which, was, which is right by Eureka, uh, right by Six Flags. And the, the, the first Green Time show that we ever did in 1996, wow. we had Marilyn Leisner on, and she was the last mayor of Times Beach, Missouri. Wow. And she was telling us about what the effects were in her town as she watched Times Beach basically destroyed so that they could clean up the poisoning there. So even in the, into the 1980s, you were still seeing the effects of dioxin and Agent Orange right next to St. Louis, Missouri. Sure, and, and uh, it has a half-life of 10 years, so mm -hmm. I don't know how long it would take. I mean, 10 years to get half of it dissipate, then another mm -hmm. 10 years to get half of that, and then another 10 years to get half of that. So we're talking decades. Uh, well, I, actually, I, I heard uh, at a conference we had in Docs uh, a, a couple of decades ago, yeah. the um, scientists who had studied it very extensively said that the half-life was actually 14 years. Oh. And so he calculated, he calculated that if th there would be so much dioxin in, uh, if a person was contaminated, that, that uh, or actually everybody in the United States, that, so that if we stop producing dioxin right now, there's still so much dioxin in the uh, eggs of the mother and the sperm of the father that the next generation would have dioxin in their system and they, even the minute amount there, that would pass down to the next generation, and it would be seven generations, or roughly 200 years, before wow. that, that there would be not be measurable levels. And so you can say that as a result of the Vietnam War, people have been seven generations cursed with dioxin in their bodies. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. Um, and one of the things I think it shows is mm -hmm. the extent that people will go to conduct mm -hmm. war. Right. You know, I mean, we, obviously nuclear weapons can destroy everything within a mm -hmm. moment's notice, but at the same time, and then we have biological weapons that mm -hmm. can bring um, total havoc, um, disease, mm -hmm. etc. And then we have chemical weapons um, like this. And, and one of the things in the research I've done is that there were people in the military who understood, at least to some extent, um, just how bad this was, but they weren't that concerned about it because it was the enemy. Um, mm -hmm. So to me, it's, it's looking at the enemy as if the person's inhuman, not an animal, or in a racist manner. And that's what you have to do, really, in order to take people's lives, including women and children who are not on the battlefield, which is what, what this has done. Um, you have to look at them as being subhuman. Um, that's one of the reasons that we really have to abolish war, because uh, we're dehumanizing. When we dehumanize other people that way, we're dehumanizing ourselves. Absolutely. And well, that, that is one of the constants of war, is, is that in every war, there's uh, racist terms that come up. In the Vietnam War, uh, Vietnamese were referred to as slopes. Mm -hmm. and, and then, in the, uh, of course, in the Indian wars to exterminate Indians in the United States, they were, there was all sorts of derogatory terms that were used against Native Americans. Right. And they were actually the first known victims of biological warfare, mm -hmm. weren't they? Yeah, um, I guess that would be the case. I'm not totally sure about that. Okay, but uh, unless there's a much older case that people know about, but I know what, what I've read about mm -hmm. is uh, Native Americans being given blankets yes. that okay. were, what, what, what did they in infect the blankets with? Uh, uh, smallpox. So that's it, smallpox. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, de uh, they deliberately put smallpox. That's right. Uh, 
germs in the blankets and then gave them to the Indians and, right. and w wiped out Indians. I think it, I can't remember if it was Wisconsin or another state where that was done. Yeah, I'm not sure, but definitely um, that's been done. And and the only reason I'm not sure during the Middle Ages if there was something that people there there well did, there well could have been doing at time too. Now, now one of the things which people are, are more aware of now in in, in in the last ten or fifteen years is the uh, use of what's called depleted uranium. That's correct. Wh which is itself a euphemism because it makes the word depleted makes it sound like this is no longer a toxic right. toxic substance. And right. of course, that comes from nuclear weapons. Yeah. And they have to do something with this irradiated material. Right. And so they they find that it's very dense and it can, it's very effective for making bombs because it can go, the uranium can go, it's denser than lead, so it can right. go right through lead. Yeah, it, it's, it's, um, it's not really a bomb, it's, it's like a bullet. A bullet, okay. Yeah, you could use it. It's a round that they usually use uh, for tank rounds. Um, and, and they might now, at least when I was in the military, they, mm. they didn't use it for artillery rounds. Mm. But the idea is, and, oh, and, of, and of course, armored Pearson rounds for machine guns. Mm. So um, the idea is to use it because, like you said, it's much denser than lead, so it, it will go through, um, through armor plating um, mm. easier. The problem with that, though, is that when it hits the armor plating, it, can vapor, it does vaporize into really, really small, fine particles mm -hmm. um, that get into the air and into the soil. So people can end up breathing, because it vaporizes, people can end up breathing these particles into their body. And, off, and of course, it's, it's also in the ground. Um, so now you have uh, radiation that you've breathed in or is in the soil. So you know that that can send it into the water table, just like um, Agent Orange. Uh, so um, in, in Iraq, in particular, um, from the first Gulf War, which I participated in, but also some of the current conflict, we have um, areas where there was heavy fighting where we have high levels of birth defects from, uh, from the, what we understand to be from depleted uranium because you have to ask, well, why they have such high birth defects in this place and not, not have yeah, it here, absolutely. you know? Um, and also with the kids being born post uh, these conflicts. Um, you know, a lot of times, not a lot of times, always, Governments that do this, the United States government is not the first one. Um, governments who do this do not want to take responsibility. So Absolutely. one of the ways not to take responsibility is to say that well, there's not a research, not enough, there's not enough correlation mm. or there's not, you really can't tie that disease right. you know, to this. It. Yeah, they dismiss it. When some things you don't have to have mm. a whole bunch of research to see mm. because it's obvious, it's obvious <laughs> right? you know what I mean? So, so that's what's going on right now when it comes to depleted uranium. And not only with the high birth defect rates in Iraq, mm -hmm. but also um, troops, soldiers who have come back and have come back sick or what, what we call Gulf War disease okay. um, we're gonna, as well. We're going to take a break mm -hmm. to, see, uh, uh, to, to see a couple of announcements and then we'll be right back to finish up talking about what's, what's been done recently in the uh, various wars in the Middle East. Hi, welcome back to Green Time. I'm host Don Fitz. With me I have Michael McPherson. Uh, executive Director of the uh, Veterans for Peace. Michael, we're just talking about the Iraq War, and one of the things about the uranium, which is used in, in, all throughout the wars in the Middle East, is that the half-life of uranium is, is something like millions or billions of years, right. which is li l longer than the existence of humanity, when you, how long this, this, would, um, this would last. In comparison, dioxin is merely 200 years. Right. <laughs> so, uh, I, I mean, it is astounding to think that there is chemicals like that. Tell me, is there, we only have about a minute left. Is, is there a major point that you would really like to leave viewers with? Well, I think, you know, when you talk about the weapon systems, and the kind of weapons that we have mm -hmm. created, we talk about dioxin using the Agent Orange, you talk mm -hmm. about depleted uranium and nuclear weapons. Um, we need to realize that we need to stop these right. wars. I mean, you know, because we're getting to the point where we're poisoning the whole planet um, in how we fight the wars and we have um, climate change, all these different things that we're doing. It just, it's just time for us to change and be different. Um, I, I think we can do it, but we have to put our minds to it and believe it. A absolutely. It's a total change in mindset. Michael McPherson, I want to thank you very much. Thank for you. participating and sharing your ideas. I want to thank the viewer for tuning into this episode of Green Time, and I hope you get a chance to look at Green Time the same time next week.